Blender 4.1 was just released, so in this video we'll dive into the new rigging and animation features that you can play with. This type of video is becoming a tradition on CG Dive, so subscribe with the all option to get all future updates. First up, we have nested bone collections. I was very excited about the new bone collections that we got in 4.0. They replaced the old, nameless and limited bone layers. In 4.0, the bone collections are even better. The big update is that you can now nest collections. Let's see how it works. I'm going to create some bones here. And move them to random layers. With the M key, I'll create a new bone collection. And something new in 4.1 are these improved menus. Previously, we only had this big OK button here, but now I can give the collection a name and I can confirm with the Move button or Cancel. Let's create more collections. Okay, so now we have these three collections, each holding some bones. I can hide and unhide the content of these collections with the eye icon, just as before. But now I can grab any of these collections and drop it on top of another collection and that will nest it. Let's do this again and here is something that you need to be aware of. As you drop your collection into another collection, you'll get some text overlay. And if it says move into, then you will be nesting this collection. If it says move above, then it will move this collection above the other collection without nesting it. I'll create some more collections with the plus button to demonstrate this. So right now it says move collection 2 below bones 001, so it will move it below it. If it says move in 2, then I'm going to nest it. And of course, this is not ideal, but the developers are aware of this and they are working on it. So in the future, it should look something like this. We'll get these lines which indicate where your collection will go once you move it. And this will be perfect, uh, however, we are not going to get this in 4.1. There is some limitation of the code right now, so um, we'll have to wait a while for the better UX. But the good news is that nesting definitely works. So I'll pull this collection out of this nesting. And now here we have a handy operator to remove unused, which is basically removing all collections that do not have any bones in them. This way I can easily clean up my collections. Here is something else that you need to be aware of. Um, I think it's very intuitive, but the visibility of the top collection controls the visibility of its children. So for example, this nested collection contains these three bones. So the eye icon hides and unhides these bones. If I have the collection visible and hide its parent collection, that will hide everything that is inside the parent collection as well as everything that is inside the child collections. Okay, I think this makes a lot of sense. And also new is this solo visibility button. If I click on it, it will display only the bones inside this collection. And keep in mind that the solo feature ignores the nesting. So, for example, here I'm soloing this top layer and it will only display the contents of that layer and not the content of its children. And also the name solo may be slightly misleading because you can solo multiple layers, okay? I can have both of these soloed out. So the solo feature gives us another layer of visibility control, which you can enable temporarily. And then as soon as you disable it, the underlying visibility settings will come through. Now I'll switch to Blender 4.0 for a second. And here I have a bunch of collections. And here I have this area which allows me to expand or contract this window. In Blender 4.1, this feature is no longer available. So if I create a bunch of collections here, you'll see that the window will keep expanding and there is no way to manually contract it. I'm a little bit divided about this update. I was quite used to controlling the size of this window here, but the idea now is that we can nest collections And so we can make this window nice and neat by using the nesting features and contracting the top collection. Oh, and by the way, you can have multiple levels of nesting. So here we have a top collection, we have a nested collection, level one and nested level two. Um, and we can keep nesting deeper and deeper. 
And finally, the bone collections are also visible in the outliner. If you expand your armature data, you'll find bone collections. And here you find your nested collections. Another important update are the new bake action options. So here I'm demonstrating with a rig, but it will be the same with objects. So I can go to pose, animation, bake action. And if you're familiar with the bake action menu, you'll definitely notice these new channels. So that means that now you're able to choose what you want to bake. Only location or only rotation, or if you shift click, you can enable location, rotation, scale. So this is definitely nice. It's a quality of life improvement. When it comes to bendy bones baking, um, I guess it's a nice quality of life improvement as well. But custom properties is the huge one. Because until this version of Blender, it was impossible or very difficult to bake custom properties. And I'm going to demonstrate why this is useful. So I'll switch to Blender 4, where I have this exact same scene. And I have a bunch of actions mixed in the NLA. This is an example from my NLA tutorial, which I believe is still relevant. You can still watch it. But here we have a bunch of actions that are mixed. And notice as I scrub through this animation that the IKFK slider changes because the arms are in IK mode in some parts of the animation and in FK mode in other parts. And the IK FK switch is a custom property. So if I select everything and try to bake now, with Blender 4, I'll set options like this and just press OK. It will work, but if I disable all of these layers so that I'm only left with the baked action, then you'll see that it is supposed to switch to IK, but it doesn't. So we couldn't fully bake an animation when custom properties were involved. Now in Blender 4.1, let's do the same. Bake action, make sure that custom properties are enabled. Press OK, disable all NLA layers so that I'm only left with the baked animation. And you'll see that everything works as expected. Actually, if I switch to the end panel, you'll see that the custom property was baked, indicated by this yellow color. And you can see how it switches here where it is supposed to switch. This is a really important update and it shows the dedication of the rigging and animation team to really improve this part of Blender. Here is a small but nice change. It is now easier to tell if you're using auto keying or not. So when auto keying is off, it has this hollow dot. And when I activate it, it is blue background and white dot. Okay, in Blender 4, it used to look like this. So it was a solid white dot on gray background when it's off. And when you enable it, it's blue background and still a white dot. So I guess some people confused this for the activated state because the dot is white. So now we have a hollow dot to indicate the off state. Moving on, there is a big change in how we add keyframes to our animations. If you animate in Blender, you should be familiar with the I hotkey. So until Blender 4, if you pressed I, you would get this kind of menu. Now I had to press K to bring up this menu. The I shortcut still exists but now it simply inserts keyframes for your predefined keying set. King sets are set over here under keying. And since I don't have a keying set right now, if I just press I, this will keyframe everything. And notice that the properties weren't keyframed. That is because these properties live here on this cogwheel. So now if I select the cogwheel and press I, everything will be keyframed, including the properties. If I define a key inset, you can have custom ones or some predefined ones like only rotation. If I select this joint and rotate it and press I, then only rotation will be keyframed. If you want to change the key inset faster, there is a shortcut, which is now Shift and K. So this looks like the set keyframe menu, but really it sets the key inset. So if I choose scale here, and then look under King, my active King set will be set to scale. So it's Shift K, and in previous versions of Blender, it used to be Control, Alt, Shift, and I. So this is a nice key map update. Something else that is interesting, if I go to Edit Preferences, Key Map, and enable Pi menu on drag, that is something that I personally don't like that much, but if I enable it now, then 
Just pressing I will insert keyframes according to the keying set, which is now set to scale, so scale was keyed. But if I press I and drag my mouse to the left or to the right, it will give me this pie menu and I'll be able to keyframe the location, rotation, scale, or the available, which is another special keying set. So I'll choose location here and location will be keyed. And here is another new option that I believe animators will appreciate. If we go to edit preferences, animation, we have the only insert needed option, which already existed before, but now we have control over when it is used. By default, it will only be used when you are in auto keying mode. But if you click the manual option, then it will also be available when you set keys manually, or you can disable both. I'll leave my settings to default. There is a new bake channel operation in the graph editor. So here I'm looking at a rotation curve in the graph editor. And if I select this curve, which is basically the X quaternion rotation channel, I can go to channel, bake channel, and this will give me the bake options. The settings are not default because I was playing with this while preparing, but, but it would look something like this. So it will bake the curve. In other words, it will set a keyframe on every frame of your animation. And there are uh, settings that you can play with if you expand the options. So you can set the range. So for example, I can make it take effect from frame 87 and up to frame 173. You can set a step, which means that it will bake not every frame, but uh, if I set it to two, for example, it will bake every other frame or every three frames. Uh, you can even go with decimals, but I'll set it to one here. You can remove outside range, which will just flatten anything before and after the range. You can set the interpolation type of the baked curve. We can set it to linear or constant. I'll set it to linear here. So this can be useful in various ways, but we have this bake modifiers option, which suggests that we can bake modifiers now. Let's undo. And I'll select this channel, go to modifiers, and add a noise modifier, for example. Let's tweak it a little bit, something like this. So this adds procedural noise on top of my keyframed animation. If I like this effect and I want to bake it so that it's no longer procedural, I can go to channel, bake channels, and make sure that the bake modifier setting is enabled, okay? Let's make it more pronounced and bake it. More updates in the graph editor. If I select some keys here and press G to move them, I can move them up or sideways, basically freeform. And something crazy about the graph editor in Blender, this is not an update, but if you press R, you can rotate the keys and S to scale them. But anyway, when you grab keys, you usually either want to just move them up and down or sideways and not in this freeform fashion. So you can achieve this by pressing Y for up and down movement and X for sideways movement. But now we have a new option on the view, auto lock key axis. So with this option, if I just press G and move the mouse up, it will only move up and down. Okay, and if I move the mouse sideways, it will only move sideways. So there is no free form movement, either up, down or left, right. Another new feature is under key, blend, scale from neighbor. And what it does is, let's place the cursor here and then scale from neighbor. And you'll see that it uses the first keyframe as the point for scaling. And if I press D while doing the operation, it will switch to the other side as a pivot point for this operation. So again, pressing D will return it to the other side. The two sides were too close together, so let's do it again with this selection. Scale from neighbor. It will scale from the one side. And then by pressing D, it will use the other end as a pivot point. And another cool improvement in the graph editor if I go to the three view and right click on a transformation channel and choose view all in graph editor or view single in graph editor, let's go for single. 
that will zoom in on the W quaternion rotation because that is what I right clicked on. If I right click on the Z view single in graph editor, that will zoom on the Z quaternion and it will also visualize it. And if I right click and choose view all, that will zoom in on all rotation channels. So very cool. I'm just curious what it does if there is no graph editor. So let's close it. And yeah, it tells me that there is no open graph editor. So I'll need to open one and then use it. We have improvements in weight paint mode. If I select this armature and shift select the mesh and go to weight paint mode, you'll see that we now have this bone icon, which means that bone selection is now an explicit selection mode. And you will have access to these selection tools here. So I can go to box select and just select some of my bones right here in weight paint mode. Personally, I don't find this so useful. I'm happy to keep my tool set to brush and just alt and click and alt shift and click to select multiple bones. However, the new selection tools may be very useful to people who use Blender with a tablet. The shortcut for bone selection mode is three. So one is face selection, two vertex selection, and three bone selection. There are improvements in drivers and the release notes say single property and context property driver variables now support a fallback value to use if the RNA path lookup fails. And if you don't have a PhD in Blender, here is what that means. I'll go to Blender and add a driver, then right click and open driver editor and switch this property here to be a single property and I'll just set the object to something and then we'll get access to this new use fallback option. So that gives your property a default value, a fallback value if the evaluation of this property fails for some reason. For example here I haven't even set a path so it will fail but if I enable use fallback that will give me a default value and right now it is zero but if I change it, you'll see the cube move on the x-axis. And the same fallback value is available for context property. And something else that is new right here is if I disable the fallback value and I don't have any path here, so the evaluation of this property will fail, then you'll see this red underline indicating that this driver has a property that failed. In the dope sheet, you may see a performance boost there is nothing to demonstrate, but performance optimization is always nice. And there is an update in motion paths. They can now be baked in screen space relative to the active camera. I'm still a bit fuzzy about this one, so I'm not going to try to explain it, but I'm sure that people who do need this feature will immediately know what it means. We also have updates in Rigify, and they are relatively simple if you understand how Rigify works in Blender 4.0, which you can learn from my updated Rigify Fundamentals course. Check it out for free on academy.cgdive.com. So the main update is that Rigify can now use nested collections. So here is how it works. I'll create the basic human meta rig, go to pose mode, and the default meta rigs do not use this feature. So if you only use the default meta rigs, then you don't need to worry about it for now. But let's say that you want to make use of this new feature. Here is a simple example. I'm going to create a new collection here and call it arms. And I'm going to nest all of my arm related collections under this main arms collection. Okay. Then I'll go to Rigify, Bone Collection, UI. And here I have this new collection, which I haven't assigned anywhere. I'm going to click on it to activate it and then assign it on this row here. And then I'll also press the plus button to create a little space between these collections and then generate the rig. Now, if I press N to expand the end panel, you'll see my updated rig layers. And I have this main arms collection. I'll hide the meta rig. And now what happens if I click on this main collection is that it will hide all collections related to arms. This FK collection wasn't hidden. That is probably because I missed something in the meta rig. So let's go back to it. And yes, I failed to nest this collection. So I'll just nest it and regenerate. 
And now this arms button will control the visibility of all arms collections. Okay, so this is how you can use nested collections in Regify. Now, if we go to pose mode, there is another small change. I'll just select the control, let's say this one, the IK control. And now if I look under the rig main properties, next to IK parent and pole parent, we now have these nice menus. Functionally, nothing has changed. This is an update in Blender, which allows us to create nicer menus and Rigify is making use of it. So if you compare this to previous versions of Blender, um, it used to be just a number here, but now we have this nice named menu. With that, we covered all updates related to animation and rigging. Of course, there are many other nice improvements, which you can see here in the development notes. One that I want to point out is under modeling, auto smooth. Auto smoothing has been changed quite dramatically, and this can also be interesting to CGDI viewers, because this may affect how we export characters to game engines and other applications. And I believe this deserves a separate video because it's quite a big update. So subscribe to the channel and you'll see it as soon as I release it. Or if you become a member of academy.cgdive.com, you will be the first to see this video. I always release new videos a little bit earlier for members. And by becoming a member for just $5.99 a month, you also get access to all of my advanced paid courses for as long as you're subscribed. I think it's a sweet deal.